So in episode 52 of the Performance Health Podcast, I got to sit down and have a chat with Dr. Elena Kerrick. Based over in the UK, she was a pediatric tuition, but now a online coach helping family members and mothers basically form the habits, behaviors, and routines to uh, gain health in the four pillars, sleep, nutrition, mindset, and, uh, and exercise, obviously. Now, this really resonated with me well because it's a sort of typical thing that I like to do and we can bounce ideas off each of us. But I wanted this episode to go with aiming at empowering the parents and the, and the families out there who may lack the time or put, them, put themselves last in a family situation and to turn that frame around so that people can put themselves first. And this is what Elena really does and helps those individuals out there. So it was a great time, a, a fantastic chat, chat with her and um, no, I'm appreciative of her time. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you do, click below and I'll catch you at the next one. That, that, that's great. Look, I looked at your website and what you do, and it resonated with so much what I try to do with performance through health. It's, uh, you know, I, I teach tools, habits, habits behaviors, and, and practices to help people manage stress, anxiety, and those sort of things. And I'm delving into nutrition. And obviously, I'm a, a background of sleep. So that's my main kind of, uh, I guess, uh, area of expertise. So for, for what you're doing, I, I love the approach that you're taking where you're trying to t- battle on with, uh, you know, f- family members, mothers, and looking at busy lifestyles of, who have lots of children. Like that's, uh, it's, you often see that. And I saw it in clinical practices r- between the age of 30 to 40, people let go of their health because they've got so much more responsibility yeah. elsewhere. And then by the time they're 45, 50, they're stuck with chronic disease. And you know, that's really life. interesting, actually, isn't it? And I think as well, when you're in your 20s, not everyone, but there's a certain amount of sort of, you've got a certain cushion there. I know that I wasn't particularly healthy in my 20s, but because you're young and your body is young, you've got time to recover that. Whereas when you get to your 40s, you're looking at, Oh, yeah, no, I really need to make a big effort now. Um, so people can sort of be in their 20s parallel and then split up. Do you see what I mean? Oh, in terms definitely. of... Oh, yeah, I, I mean, and then you know, as you're a 20 year old, 25 year old, just it's not at the forefront of your mind. You're not concerned. You're not at that area or time in your life where you're thinking, oh, I need to start thinking about my health and longevity. You're, you're, no, I know. You're... And I was a medical student and we didn't think any of that at all. We were out partying and, you know, like... It was we didn't get any lectures on how to live healthily and we were not living healthily at all. It was sort of like work hard, play hard was the motto. And we definitely did the whole. Well, both of them, really. Yeah. And, and in the medical field, you know, you're doing such long hours as well. You, you, with anything, you're probably well, such, certainly more high stressful job than the majority, you know, 95 percent of the, the, the population. And then the hours that some of the, the doctors, especially during med school, it's almost like a, a badge of honor to say, hey, this is how many hours, hours I did. Yeah, totally, totally. It's not great. <laughs> So, so what kind of made you, I guess, move away from, are you, are you still practicing medicine? No, not clinically. Okay. Okay. And what, so what is your, so what I'll, made I'll just, you move I'll, away? I'll, yeah. yeah. So my, my history is basically that like you, I love traveling and I think to be honest, part of the reason I went into medicine was to travel. Um, and I, yeah, as you say, medicine is stressful long hours there was a particular there was another pandemic um now it must have been thinking how old my middle son is 11 years ago I was pregnant with my second son when um Mm. swine flu came out was it for swine flu it was swine flu wasn't it and at that time they said oh pregnant women shouldn't be in contact with people who potentially have swine flu I was doing general pediatrics and, you know, there was no protection for me. And I remember this one weekend where I went in to do a weekend of nights in a busy hospital. And I had arranged with my senior doctor to sort of swap so that I could do not the general pediatric, which is covering the accident and emergency, but covering the people who were essentially in hospital already. So you knew what their diagnosis were, which obviously made it easier to avoid all of those. Hey, what, what's wrong with me issue, potentially swine flu. Anyhow, when I got to hospital, the swap hadn't been made and I had to basically say, hey, I'm like, you know, eight weeks pregnant, like you don't want to do to all these colleagues who they weren't colleagues I worked with normally anyhow. And it was all a bit of a disaster. And I ended up doing the night shift, seeing all these patients who were potentially swine flu. And then on Monday, 
phoning my senior consultant and saying, hey, this happened. And she clearly was very stressed. I, you know, at the height in time, but she just lost the plot and she shouted and she screamed and she yelled. And I heard afterwards that, you know, there was a sort of group of people outside the room, sort of like quavering and going, quivering, going, what on earth is going on? But she yelled at me for an hour. Wow. And yeah, exactly. I was like, in, and I'm like, work shouldn't be like this. What is going on? Like I work in pediatrics. It's about supporting the, the health of, of children. Doesn't that include my unborn child? Um, my mother lives in France. And at that time I spoke to her, it must've been October time, freezing cold. I was in South Wales at the time, just turned the heating on. And there's my mum in her back garden with a little summer t-shirt on going, oh, France is great kind of thing. And I was just like, we've always wanted to move abroad. Why, what, what are we waiting for? I can wait here and, you know, wait until I finish my training and then clearly I'm never going to leave or I can just dive in and go now. So I moved to Spain thinking, oh yeah, I can carry on my clinical practice because we were all in the European Union. Mm. Another long story, but turns out that no, that wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. So essentially I turned to the internet to stop myself from getting really bored and having something to do. And I did picky eating for kids because one, my kids were picky and I was a bit surprised about that. And two, the background of that is healthy eating for kids. So how do we teach our kids to eat healthily? And then gradually over the years, I've pivoted really because I have seen that a lot of problems that people have with picky eating for kids is that they want to teach their kids healthy eating, yet they aren't eating healthily themselves. And that's an impossible place to be in. You can't teach your kids. Kids learn by, you know, demonstrating and copying. Mm. So the best way to teach your kids healthy eating and living is to demonstrate healthy eating and living. So now I help mothers. Did that answer your question? A very long answer. <laughs> no, that's like, I, I love what you've put into perspective there because that's really opened up my mind to questions on uh, what we do. Because we know, we know children just look at parents as a, a, a figure they you know it's not like they're relating on a, an adult level where you try and tell them something they understand it and go away and do it it's literally your actions are then passed on straight through to the to the child uh, so like you what you're saying is basically to then to teach the parents how they need to change their habits and then passing that through to the children is that is that what you were saying you do yeah you, you were doing a- Pretty much. I mean, the bottom line is, if you look at eating habits and you look at children growing up, the reality is, is that the people who come from families where they are just eating, you know, relatively healthily and they've got a good relationship with food and, you know, they might enjoy food. We might have parties and celebrations, but there's no emotional attachment to food. Mm. So limits is another interesting thing to think about. But essentially, you're eating vegetables a reasonable amount of the time, those children are going to grow up and eat in that way. You don't really have to do anything other than sit down and eat your meal and it be a healthy meal. Those kids are going to grow up with healthy eating habits. You know, I can say for myself that I was lucky. My parents, we always had vegetables at the meal time, So there would either be a salad or vegetables. And for me, I've kind of grown up thinking if I don't have vegetables on my plate, it doesn't feel like I've had a meal and it's just a habit, yeah. Yeah. but it's one that I've obviously developed from childhood. Whereas obviously the reverse is true. If you don't have vegetables and you grow up in a household that doesn't have vegetables, then it's not normal for you to have vegetables. You don't think, oh, I have to have vegetables. So those parents who are in that situation where they're thinking, oh, I need to teach my kids healthy eating. Well, it's not about teaching. It's just about, okay, let's just do healthy eating and your kids will just naturally pick it up is essentially you don't have to do anything other than be aware of certain things. Don't pressure your kids to eat. Don't make that emotional connection. So for example, don't reward children's behavior with food. You know, oh, if you're good, you can have a cookie. If you're bad, then you can't have dessert. Don't do that. Yeah, I think, that's, I, th- I think that's a, a big one, really, because I can remember as a child, it was almost like if you finish your dinner, you're allowed to have dessert. And I would be like, mm. uh, so it's almost like rewarding someone to finish a exactly. plate and then they do get dessert. So it's it, it that probably itself is is a, a bad habit to teach. I know for mm-hmm. if, if I'm talking about my my own personal experience, my own habits, luckily, 
I'm, in, I'm an active individual and, and I'm health conscious and I'm aware of what I'm eating, but I do have a real sweet sugar tooth. And I can remember growing up, it was okay. Monday to Friday, my mom would eat, my mom would cook all the time, but sometimes she would only cook relatively, you know, your, your English smiley faces, beans, sausages, that sort of thing. But then, <laughs> but then there'll be the Sunday roast with the vegetables and, uh, you know, real whole foods. But then at the weekends, it was almost like a bit of a reward to go and get your candy or the, the chocolate or sweets. And I think that for me has still ingrained that habit in me. And I, I don't believe it's ideal for my personal health um i noticed when i'm stressed it's a reward for me to go uh, to go away and eat some some foods that i enjoy it's an escape and i think that's also a coping mechanism from from when I'm younger as well i think my mom might gave me sweets to soothe me when i was upset perhaps yeah no definitely and it's um you know i can remember before i became aware of it as a mother you know typically your child is doesn't want to get into their car seat. Oh my goodness. Such, such drama for young children, car seats. And from an adult, as you say, we just want to explain to them in this, you know, rational way, Hey, you have to put your car seat on because if we're in an accident, et cetera, et cetera, but it, they are not interested in that at any way no. at all. So I discovered that it was really easy to give them a biscuit and go, ah, oh, suddenly it's so easy to put the car seat on until I realized that that is exactly what I was doing. I was changing my child's behavior it's much easier for me. It's much more difficult to go through all that, you know, you have to put your car seat on and I have to calm you down so I can put your car seat on when really all I want to do is buckle up the car seat and get off and, and drive away. But being aware of that really helped me change that, Good. that Good. mindset. So what kind of was it that uh, was it through education that you learned that? Was it through yourself having coaching? What, what, what was it that managed to change your perspective there, I guess? Well, I guess regarding the food that I did, like my kids had being picky eating. So when I was doing general pediatrics, I'd get so many people who'd come with their kids going, my child's got tummy ache. It's a really common problem. Quite often I would diagnose constipation and go, it's because your diet, you're not eating enough fiber, enough vegetables. And I would be like, oh, it's great news. You know, you don't have to have medicine. It's fabulous. All you need to do is eat more vegetables. Isn't that amazing? And then fast forward a few years and I've got kids and I realize how difficult it is. You know, I'm presenting them with vegetables, but they're not eating the vegetables. Excuse me. <coughs> what a tickle. Um, and I remember one day my son sitting on the toilet in the bathroom crying tears of pain because hey guess what he's he's constipated and it wasn't that I wasn't presenting him with the fruits and the vegetables but what I was doing was presenting portions that were too big so he could just eat out the pasta and leave the vegetables it's another really common thing that children do um and me going oh my goodness there's more to it than just presenting mm. your children with vegetables and so that was regarding healthy eating that sort of really set me on this path of oh wow there's like nutrition has moved on a lot from when I was at medical school well on one level on one level when I look back to my childhood you know it was vegetables are healthy packaged food not so healthy we kind of know that in broad strokes but in another level we know so much more about nutrition now we know more about our biome and how that affects us so we know more minutiae but there is still you know vegetables are healthy and packaged foods aren't so healthy um, but I started diving into that and really understanding. And I think for me as well, realizing that, you know, I was born of this era of white, what I call white refined carbohydrates. So thinking about bread and pasta and essentially, you know, when I look back, I didn't have this mindset of pasta is a refined mm. thing. It was just like, oh, pasta is just, it's relatively healthy. It's what we eat. I guess I always ate it in a portion size that wasn't too big. But now I look back and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I used to have breakfast cereal or bread for breakfast and then bread for lunch and then pasta or rice or potatoes or something with vegetables. But there was this theme of this re white refined carbohydrate. And my brain did not want to accept that. It was just like, oh, that's normal. But it took a bit of time to really sort of get to this stage of, do you know what? You actually don't need any of that white refined carbohydrates because you've got vegetables, which are carbohydrates. Um and it's okay to have some of them. It's not like you have to exclude them entirely, 
but you know we are what i call born of the carbohydrate era when we were told eat you know relatively high carbohydrates and eat low fat and that is a message that we're beginning to see is not true and that eating you know extra virgin olive oil good sources of fat is a good a good thing to do and i had to retrain myself with that as well like even though i've never eaten low fat foods i realized that when i make salad dressing i was limiting myself you know or you can have a little bit of salad dressing and now i live in spain it's the world's largest producer of olive oil i use loads of olive oil and it, i really had to work on that oh you can you can have more olive oil if you want it's okay you can have a little bit more salad dressing it's actually good for you and it helps you feel full up so that was the beginning of the nutrition piece just sort of like really going in getting up to date of what current thinking was and you know current th- i'm sure it will change in 5 years time we'll know more and we'll understand more it's one of those areas nutrition which is been a challenge for people to look into and even the science to look into because it's so hard to do nutritional science studies and yeah, I think absolutely especially the the uk and america post world war the you know, there's a financial depression so it's about trying to make food as cheap as possible and in quantities yeah. and then we ended up getting the refined carbohydrates and then the guidelines say 60 percent of food should be come from carbohydrates so then 60 percent of food was coming from almost refined yeah. carbohydrates where you know I, I love what you said there there's a couple of things that you said there which are really important number one portion size looking at the portions you've given your child, if you've got a, a substantial amount of food that they're really going to enjoy, like the pastas or the, the, the rice or the, 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 um, you know, the bread, and then all of a sudden you've got another bit that's vegetables, if there's too much this side and they finish all that yeah. first, because we all know that no one eats the vegetables first. No, it's always, you know, <laughs> Except it's me. Always, yeah, it's always, the, it's always the food as a child that you enjoy the most you go towards, unless you're trained to eat the vegetables first. Absolutely. So one thing I loved there was thinking about what portions are you giving in terms of your macronutrients, your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates, and what type of carbohydrates. Um, and the second thing was the actual awareness of the, how the guidelines might not be right. And that nutrition itself isn't about ruling out things, but it's about having a good relationship with the right things. Mm-hmm. And being saying to yourself, like you said, with the uh, the olive oil is like, no, I can have that. It's full of healthy fats, but as long as I'm not having too much carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate and that on top of it. And then this here, you know, it's, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. And you make a good point. And it's really interesting to look back over the last, you know, hundred years and think, well, all that farming and all those refined carbohydrates you know what we have gained out of that is peace in Europe and you know you look back to the years before that and Europe was not such a peaceful place and it's easy to be in this position of like oh we take it for granted that we've got peace in Europe Um, but and I think the two are connected you know a lot of it was to do with food is scarce and now Mm -hmm. food is totally plentiful and now we've really had to train our mindset around food as you say children or adults even they're what we call glucose seeking missiles so (laughs) it's in our nature to seek glucose and that glucose can come in the form of you know pasta or cakes or sweets it used to come in the form of blackberries and figs and things like that and it's very difficult to overeat those foods that you can glut and glut but use the amount of calories that you've eaten compared to you know a packet of ice cream or a packet of cookies. Hmm. It's much more difficult to do that. But both adults and children, that is like part of, it's one of our survival instincts to do that. And it served us very, very well until we've got to this stage now where we can just help ourselves to food and we don't have to do any work to get to it at all. We just, you know, decide, the work is deciding what we're going to eat and that's it. Yeah, I I agree. I think the abundance that we have of food in in Western society and societies that are plentiful in it has made uh, some of the biggest negative impacts, positive and negative impacts on our health. Positive in the fact that we can uh, now think about different things. We can go out and not have to worry about food not being readily available. But then the other option is that you go to uh, no, to fill up your petrol and all of a sudden you've got candy bars right at the front to pick up and yeah. uh, you know they're right in front of you it, it's 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 the marketing and the advertising that's bombarding us now because there's such an abundance of it and it's such an industry that it's becoming uh, devastating to our health yeah no it's really interesting isn't it and just thinking about 
abundance in general that we kind of our, our bodies our brains become accustomed to it so I look at my children and you know my children have everything that they need you know there's nothing they don't need except they still want more and they want to sort of sit around doing nothing mm. and I think when you don't have something when you grow up with less things you strive to get those things as opposed to I've got everything on a plate now I just need to sit back and do nothing. Isn't life boring? Whereas, you know, there's a certain amount of adventure in as humans, if we can think that something's wrong and we need to fix it, we work out how to make it better. Yeah, oh, I hope I agree with that. Um, so I do want to just frame this conversation around um, importance of people who are coming into mothership or, 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 or have uh, children themselves and what they can do to kind of, I guess, maintain their own health and help with their, their their children's health now just as a i guess uh, an authority you're you're a doctor which is amazing but you're a parent so how many children do you have uh, so just four. To frame, <laughs> exactly so that's what i wanted to get at i knew you had i knew you had four children um so for the parents out there who have got one two you've managed four children what time frame <laughs> was that so my i had twins my number three was um oh, wow. number three and four so my oldest was four and a half. And then there's just under two years between the oldest. So he must have been around two. And then I had twins. So they're all really close together, actually. Yeah. So but now they're nearly nine and the oldest is 13. Exactly. Cool. But I just wanted to, because that's really important for the people who I really want to, to, to add value to here. So one of the things you talked about is most people do struggle with being able to once they've had children, fit the healthy lifestyle in. And when I looked at your information, one of the things that you do like to do is really demonstrate how can we fit it all in? How can uh, parents fit in their health? Um, and that comes down to a capacity thing or a time thing, I believe. So I'd love you to touch on that, please. Yeah, well, I think it comes down, well, there's lots of so many things. Great question. So first of all, I think it's a mindset piece. And I think you can see it makes sense when you are a mother, you have a baby, you're responsible for that baby 24 hours a day. And that becomes your primary focus, more or less. Now, obviously, as the baby grows up, they become more autonomous, be able, being able to do more things. But our mindset stays the same. And it's almost like you put yourself at the bottom of the list of things that need to be done until you have a wake up call, which goes, hey, you know what, I need to start looking after myself. And for those mothers who are thinking, you know, I need to give to my child and I still putting them at my at the top of the list. I would say the reality is you turn up to be a better mother when you have the energy to do all of the things that you want to do. I don't know about you, but when I am sleep deprived and tired, I'm like an angry bear. And that's not a great place to be doing anything from, let alone mothering. So number one is really giving yourself permission to look after yourself. And then how do you do that? Well, I have a framework. I teach four pillars. So I teach healthy eating, healthy exercise. So loving moving your body, sleep, which we're going to talk to you about soon on my podcast. <laughs> but as you know, sleep is super important. Um, and so many people don't prioritize sleep. And again, it's one of those things that in the last 20 years, the research on sleep has really um, grown as opposed to when I was mm. at university. And then the last pillar is mindset, which includes emotional wellness and stress levels. Again, another, you know, important piece. And then you have to think, okay, so these are the four things that I need to work on. How do I create that lifestyle that fits in with my busy life so that I can do all of these things? And the answer essentially is systems, habits, and routines. What you want to do is take away any thinking about it. So I like to think of our thinking brain, which is, you know, that part of our brain, which we kind of consider ourselves, but it's planning, it's remembering things, it's, you know, making lists and all of that kind of stuff. And then we have other parts of our brain, which are essentially work on automation. Um, and it's very efficient. It gets things done. You do things without thinking. And here's the key. You do things without thinking. But that without thinking can work either way, it might be something that serves your goal of being a healthy person or doesn't serve your goal of being a healthy person. So it could be, I just have this habit of getting up and exercising. That's a fabulous habit. But it could also be, I have a habit of sitting down after dinner and not moving for three hours because I'm watching television. 
that's not such a great habit in terms of, you know, it's okay to watch a bit of television, but, you know, the other piece is self-awareness. So understanding where you are. And so, you know, the short answer to how do I create, how do I get there is like habit. I can talk to you so much about habits and how there are better ways and not so better ways of creating habits. But the short answer is repeat, 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 repeat. How do you create a habit? You just do it over and over and over and over again. And you get to the stage where you just do it without thinking. Yeah. And that's it. It's just normal life. I, I love that in terms of it's like it is having that awareness first. So you kind of do have to um, review your life to begin with. It's like taking or even taking that first step to say, hey, actually, is my health at a, in a good place in general? Putting yourself first, like you said, if you're if you're a parent and your health is not great, you're not you're not going to be able to serve your family the best you can do. And uh, no, there's a, a, a lot of a grand old saying if, if you whenever you if there's a plane crash for example you put the oxygen on yeah, yourself exactly. first it, it's it, it's it's that same thing of of putting yourself first and then you can treat others and when you're able to do that or if you're not doing that and you find that your health is deteriorating then you need to be able to step back and say okay why is this happening so that's the mm-hmm. awareness piece and then okay well what habits are not allowing this to to uh for, for my life to then change sort of thing and I mean, I, I think it's looking at the poor habits first, right? And trying to see whether you can just remove those or swap those. For, for me, as a, what I try to help people with is going, okay, if you were to look at yourself and be honest and be truthful and say, what unhealthy habits or what habits do I have that are not serving me right now? That maybe I could just remove one or two to begin with and replace those with a new habit. That's one step that I take. What sort of what we don't have to delve into to too much because we could be here for you know another two hours talking just about habits. But what are the I guess one or two tips that you usually start with? Yeah, well, first of all, I think you're right. You have to be careful not to take too much on board at once, particularly if you're doing it by yourself. So if you're working with a professional health coach, then you know you need to be led by them and you can actually obviously get there faster. That's kind of the point of having a coach. And obviously, I recommend everybody get a coach. Um, I think coaches are amazing. There's still a sort of mindset of, oh, coaches are for immortal people as opposed to, you know, regular people. Um, But so if you can do it by yourself, then you're right. Just take one small habit and make one change. And then once that has been a once that's ingrained and when is it ingrained? It's ingrained when you have stopped thinking about it. So if you're remembering to do it, it's not a habit at the moment. It's still what I call a seedling habit. But you get to that stage of, oh, yeah, I just do this without thinking, then it's a habit and then you can make another one. But I think as well being, you know, one thing that I see is people set themselves up. I I talk about the rickety bridge from where you are now to where you want to get to. And people go along the rickety bridge and they go, I'm going to make these habits. I'm going to do this. And then obviously life happens. It always happens. Life always happens. And then you go back to your old habits and then people start beating themselves up and going, oh, it doesn't work for me. Nothing works for me. It's like, no, 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 no. This is part of the course. You have a human body and a human brain, and this is how your body and brain work. What you have to do is just be aware that this is part of the journey. And instead of giving up and going back, you just need to keep going. It's as simple as that. But people get caught in this mindset of, oh, it didn't work. It did work. You just didn't give it enough time to carry on, essentially. It goes back to the you know, we're uh, the, the glucose chasers. We're also the instant gratification chasers as yeah, well. It, you know, we, yeah. we want the fast reward. We want to we want to you know win the lottery. It's it's all about that. Whereas really that's not that's not a life perspective. Like I said, life does happen, and when people live just day to day, just chasing just small little repetitive things, we don't become aware of the big changes that you can make. But if you just change one or two habits, and then six months later. Review, review your life and say okay what has actually yeah. changed how do I feel how much more present am I what are my energy levels like yeah. that's when you're going to notice the sort of change really but because we're so trapped in this dopamine kind of sort of like you know yeah. this is what I want right now sort of attitude um we yeah it's it's challenging for for people and people say oh after a week I, I know so many people that will say I start a diet on Monday and then oh, the following Monday they'll lose they might lose a, a few a fair few pounds and be happy but most of that's just weight water loss or inflammation mm-hmm. and or just less a few full food volume but then the following week 
they might only lose half a pound and go, oh, that's it. I give up. I didn't lose any more. Yeah, absolutely. Any more absolutely. And, and I think as well, it's this people lose track of where they were. So, um, for example, I'm working with somebody at the moment. Um, she's in my group program and she has a problem with binge eating at nighttime. So after her kids have gone to bed, she likes to eat lots and lots. And we've been working on that. And when I say to her, how are things going? She's like, oh, so badly. Then when we look at it and go, okay, so a month ago, you were doing this 20 days out of 30. And now you're doing it 10 days out of 30. That in my mind is a huge win. You've really made progress. But what she sees is, oh, I didn't, do it for the last i sorry i did do it for the last three days therefore it's all a disaster i can't do this but if you take a step back and look at where you are you've actually made huge progress but nobody ever gives themselves credit for this progress they're just like oh this is the new normal and mm. now i have to move forwards we don't celebrate the the wins that we have made and the changes that we have made i think uh, there's a there's a quote by tony robbins who's one of the largest uh, lifestyle coaches and performance coaches in the world he says turn your expectations into appreciations and your life will change mm -hmm. in a matter of seconds it's like okay well you have this expectation to be able to change like that but actually if you look back and appreciate what you have been able to change yeah that's going to create that positive emotion and positive psychology to keep going driving towards to it so you know i love i love that concept yeah absolutely and this is why that pillar number four is so so important it, you need to work on that mindset stress emotions because if you don't you start making changes, you're full of possibility, your brain is going, hooray, this is fabulous, life happens, that despondency happens, and your brain just goes, I don't like change. Let's mm. just keep things as they are. And you listen to it. And that's the, the, you know, the difficult place to be in. It certainly is. And I think that's because there's so much lack of self-love in the world. Like you know, how can you yeah. look after your, how can you look after yourself is one of the, one of the questions that you will often talk about is, is actually, it is that self-love. And when people don't love themselves, they live in a life of fear and live in a life of self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's, it goes back to that, just, uh, just a cycle of, okay, I'm not worthy so therefore yeah. I can't, I can't have what I want. So therefore I'm going to just going to spoil everything. And often people, it's an unconscious yeah. thing or people are conscious of yeah. it, but just don't, don't know they can stop it. So I love how you're delving into the, you know, the psychology and the emotion uh, sort of things. So what in that kind of area, I guess, I'd love to hear a, um, uh, a real positive story that you've, you've, you've took your clients through in that sort of area, if you, if you can think of one. Yeah, okay. So um, one story that comes to mind is um, Alexis, who's a dentist, and I use her name because we've recorded a podcast and she tells her story on it. So she is a dentist and she wanted to lose weight and she would eat chocolate on the way back from work. And we sort of unwrapped this and started thinking about, well, why do you eat chocolate on the way back from work? And really what was going on for her was this feeling of, I want a reward because I've been working hard and I don't look after myself enough. I don't have any me time. There's no sort of appreciation for me. And a lot of people like to get appreciation from an external stimulus, but I think we need to give ourselves appreciation from an internal stimulus and really be in control of you know, ourselves rather than looking for other people to fulfill our happiness um, bucket. So anyhow, we obviously worked on her food and what she was eating, but also it's about working on, well, what, how else can you fulfill that need? So for her, she started running or she went back to running really. And she also managed to get some time that she considered me time. So she loves reading novels, but when you're a parent, it's really difficult to find time to read novels because you're working and you've got kids and then you're exhausted. So she managed to get that time in of having time for herself and really, you know, taking care of that, I need a reward. I think the other piece that we looked at as well was when she was driving back, she started listening to things like podcasts as well and really just reframing that as this is a reward for myself. I don't need that reward to be chocolate. I can find other ways of rewarding myself and nurturing myself that aren't based in food. And so once we put in all of these pieces, that need to eat chocolate just disappeared at that time. And, you know, she went through stages where she actually gave up chocolate in the end. I think she ended up going, you know, eating chocolate, but in moderation. But I think where you want to get to is 
you don't have to exclude a food source if you don't want to, but you have a good relationship with it in that I always say, if you're going to eat something, eat it and really enjoy it. Just be all in and eat it and just don't feel guilty about it. But if you're going to eat something, celebrate eating it and really, really enjoy it rather than eat it in a guilty way thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. No, just do it. Mm. Um, and yeah, enjoy it. Yeah. So I that's where she is now. There's in terms of the, the, the reframing of things there, like uh, I know, for example, going back again in my 20s, like uh, reward might have been going out socializing and having a couple of drinks and beers or some candy or something like that. Whereas now a reward for me is, yeah, giving yourself the time to, to do some self-development, to do some journaling, to, to read a book that's really going to develop yourself. And uh, it, it's looking at it from that different perspective of saying, actually, these are both positive but which one is is serving me better and also some people think okay well actually it's challenging to to try and to try and grow but I, I just found that in my passive time driving in the car if I just put my earphones in and listen to a podcast and just kept doing that I was just learning so much that content able then able to me to become aware of new things and I think that's the education that is the uh, is the great um, I guess opportunity there really yeah, I think it's really fun, actually, um, and so empowering as well. Like the play the, with emotions, where I think we want to get to is we have emotions. And what I would say is we are emotional creatures. Sorry. That's okay. I don't mean to. <laughs> it's just coming to get the puppy, one of the workers. It's still there. Oh, you've just frozen. Yeah. yeah, I'm back. Are you back? There we go. Okay. Okay, fine. Should I say that bit again? Yes, please. So, yeah, what I think is we are emotional creatures who think as opposed to thinking creatures who feel emotions. And I think if we can understand that we can change our thoughts and we can change our emotions, then it's not about never feeling those emotions, but it's about not what I call spiraling down the negative plug hole. So say, for example, someone says something to you, they upset you, you can process that emotion and then get on with doing whatever it is you want to do for the rest of the day, as opposed to, okay, it's three days later and I'm still dwelling on this and it's affected my work and it's affected my relationships. And I'm just in this little hole of, oh my goodness, my friend said this to me or whatever the upset was. And I think that's where we want to get with emotions. It's a bit like um, I use the analogy of being in a big river. So, you know, the river is the river of emotions and you're being flung from side to side. But once you get this understanding and self-awareness and the tools to help you, then it's like you've got a little kayak and you can you're still on the same river. But instead of being bashed from side to side, you're now going down the river and it's a much smoother ride and you're more in control of exactly where you're going as opposed to just being at the whim of the river. Yeah, you can more meander your way rather than having a, an issue with the resistance of the, the waves bashing you side to side. I, I love that. I, I always think that as, as motions are like the wind, you know, they just pass through, you'll feel it, then they'll, then they'll be gone the next, yeah. next moment. Oh, it's been a lot of uh, lovely content in there. It really has. <laughs> No, it sounds like a, you, you, you're doing some, some wonderful work with women out there. And I, and I know parents looking at my, my mom in particular, in the, in the past, she struggled with her diet. She's had up and down um, yo-yo dieting. And, and, and I have those conversations with her now as a bit more of a, I guess, uh, a mature individual. I can have the conversations about the self-love and the self-doubt and can see the patterns and say, hey, actually, if you put yourself first rather than, being such a nice person and thinking you need to be nice to everyone else first, then you, you know, you'll, you'll start to make those changes. And she's in her late fifties now and um, still hasn't managed to make those changes and she's struggling massively. So I'm going to send this over oh. to her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to chat to her if she ever wants to chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We've been chatting away for, I think we're 40, 45 minutes now. Um, so as, as most podcasts should finish and always how, so how do people do get in touch with you or, or if they wanted to chat to you more, how do they do that? Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for asking. Yeah. My website is drlena.com. So that's D-R-O-R-L-E-N-A. I have a podcast, Fit and Fabulous at 40, 
um, and beyond with amazing guests. Super excited to be recording a podcast on sleep with you. Um, you. And yeah, so I... I have lots of resources there, like, you know, free handouts. So I've got one, which is that roadmap of where you are now to how you're going to get there. And if people want to talk to me about working with me, either one-on-one -on -one, or I have an amazing group program, actually, then through the website, they can book and chat, you know, book a chat to talk to me. That sounds absolutely great. That sounds, uh, I'll, I'll um, put it all in the show notes so people can actually see Perfect. below. They'll see your website and they'll see, um, if you want to send me links to the, to the resources and stuff, I can put more in there as well. Um, and then I'll link that over to your website and send the information over to. Thank you very much for, for jumping on. It's been a pleasure to chat and uh, we'll do the roles in reverse. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. No worries. Thank you.